Boom. Oh, okay. I see it live on Facebook in red, big red colors. Oh, live. Exciting. We are more alive than Zoom would suggest. Good morning, everybody. <laughs> Welcome to a fantastic Labor Day weekend. And for those of you lounging, that's why some of us still go to work so that you can totally enjoy. But aside from uh, stealing these few minutes, I will be enjoying lots of time with my wife and family. And I hope everyone has a chance to do things, do things that you enjoy doing and that replenish your energy. And I thank Mr. Carl Coffey and his wife for allowing him to do this on the weekend, on a holiday weekend. Carl Coffey is my special guest. My name is Uri Schneider from Schneider Speech, and it is a big treat. We're going to have a great conversation, uh, very special, unique insights, as every conversation brings. But Carl is a very special, unique individual, and I think we're going to get to some very very unique perspectives, stories, memorable stuff you're going to walk away with and hopefully some thoughts that will keep you thinking. And also, we're going to hit on and there'll be some links that will drop throughout our conversation for you to follow up with some great things that Carl's involved with at the National Stuttering Association and related projects, as well as opportunities to see what's cooking at Schneider's speech. And so we are so excited. So just to do the quick obligatory uh, introduction. I will say I forgot my bow tie. I was going to do my best Carl Coffee impression, at least <laughs> profile pic. Um, so Carl Coffee is an amazing guy, and he works at United Health on processes and making things work and making things efficient. And um, he'll tell us more about that. I thought he was like Delta Force, but apparently that's just an industry term. Um, and Carl is also, uh, in addition to being a fantastic professional, is a, a guy who's going to be celebrating his first anniversary married in a couple weeks. Is that right? Yes. And uh, uh, on the 28th. So I'm not going to do the mental math. It's still pretty early, but 28th will be one year that my wife has put up with me. So that's, I'm very happy about that's that. Awesome. And hopefully many more years of her putting up with you. Definitely. Um, <laughs> Word to the wise after 19 years, I just recommend don't don't forget it on the 28th. Whatever number of weeks <laughs> it is, put something really big on your calendar. Yeah. Don't forget it. And uh, and Carl is also a, a board member at the National Stuttering Association and just an all-around amazing guy. And this is actually our first live conversation. We've had some digital interaction. So you're getting in right at the beginning. Um, so welcome, Carl. Maybe just want to introduce yourself. Tell us what you think we should know and We'll kick it off from there and then I'll share a story that I thought would be really clutch for this conversation. Oh, I'm excited about the story. Um, so thank you, Ari. Uh, my name is Carl Coffey. I am a person who stutters and I always like to say that now because uh, for a long time I didn't like to admit that um, because stuttering was something that I was ashamed of and afraid to acknowledge. So for me, that's, that's a big part of my identity and something I like to be upfront with. Um, I live in Bowling Green, Kentucky. And as you said, I have been married for almost a year. Um, we have two cats uh, and a dog um, and they keep me pretty busy. So uh, when we do get to thinking about kids, I know that um, we'll have a busy household, that's for sure. Um, let's see, I've been involved with the National Stuttering Association for uh, probably since 2015, 2016 is when I went to my first uh, chapter meeting um, and I kind of went because I was looking for a refuge for stuttering support. I had started a new job and felt like I was stuck. And I had all these ideas of things I wanted to say, and I felt like I wasn't executing on them. And I just, you know, felt very um, like, what do I do? And um, uh, I actually was watching your conversation with uh, Dr. Y Yaris from a few days ago and with him talking about the variability of stuttering and I'd never really known what to call it but that for me has been something that's been so frustrating because for a lot of people watching now I'm sure you probably will be like well this guy doesn't stutter at all like no, <laughs> or I can't I, see I, I try to yeah. find people that, uh, <laughs> they're actors so you, yeah, you, you're yeah. telling us really it's true you do you, you do stutter because you introduce yourself like that but I don't hear yeah, you. Stutter, yeah, I, so I guess you don't stutter. So yeah. that's very confusing <laughs> for those of us on the outside. I, <laughs> I've, I've actually had <clears throat> a few speech therapists. Um, I've been in the session with them and, you know, been talking, kind of just doing the, hey, so tell me about yourself. Why are you here? And, you know, um, 
I've been talking with them for five minutes and they're like, okay, well, what do you want to work on? Because I can't hear anything. Um, and so for me, it's a very situational, um, you know, with certain people, I might not stutter at all. And other people, I just can't seem to get a word out. And for me, the really frustrating thing, and I know we're probably getting into topics that you have lined just up, go. but, just, but. Just go. It's, it's <laughs> like you wrote, we're just going to chop it up. We're going to chop yeah. it up. Ducky chop style. it up chop chop yeah so um yeah i mean i think that's for me been the most frustrating thing because you know i in internally i have all of these fears of oh my gosh i know saying my name is hard and so i know that this word used to give me problems when i was 10 what is that going to happen now and like if you saw the uh if you saw the mental gymnastics that's probably going through my head at any point in time and thinking of words and sentence uh, structures, you know, it's exhausting. And um, I think I'm a lot better about it now. And <clears throat> the approach I try and take now is I want to be a deliberate communicator, however that comes out. If it's stuttering or not, I want to say what I want to say. Um, and I know that sometimes it'll be easier for me than others. Um, and I think for me, that's the interesting, weird, frustrating thing about stuttering is that you can never pinpoint it. If it was always one type of stuttering or sounding the same, then I think a lot of people would be able to cope with it better. But because it's so variable and kind of unknown, that's really frustrating for a lot of people. So um, yeah, that's my intro. I'm Carl. I'm a guy who stutters. I'm a nerd. I like uh, pop culture and um, I love dogs. That's, that's, huh? I feel like if you were to put something on, on, if you put something on my tombstone, that would probably be it right there. Yeah. Recently, someone told me they were geeking out on stuttering all about me. And I, I was, I said, <laughs> as a teenager, that wasn't very flattering, but I guess now understanding <laughs> nerd and geeking out can be kind of like, yeah, if you're into that stuff, that's like the best thing that could happen to you. So when you say you're a nerd, what does that mean for those of us that are not as, uh, nerdy or geeked out as that might mean. Yeah, so um, I love puns. I love dad jokes. I don't mean nerd is in the sense of, you know, I stayed up to watch all the installments of uh, Star Trek as a kid because I'm not a nerd in that sense. But wait, 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 wait. is there something wrong with that? Because I know- No, 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 there, there is nothing wrong with that. I am not here to pass judgment. I'm just saying, in my mind, I define nerd as someone who's just goofy, geeky, silly. Um, you know, I think we should take back the- context of how we use nerd um to me yeah, it's a very positive thing and, exactly. and we see like, <laughs> things that, exactly. that years ago would have been unacceptable as words mm -hmm. for example the word queer you know mm -hmm. or something that would be uh derogatory and judgmental and not taken well now has been reappropriated you know by an right. entire community so words change over time given context and i'm mm -hmm. happy we're touching the sensitive stuff but i think of urkel when i think of nerd Guy yeah. with a bow tie and a pants, <laughs> with a belly button, or maybe even a little higher. Um, yeah. But you were saying that this is a big moment for you. Your AirPods are working for the same for the first time. They are. They are. Uh, we, we were saying before we went live that um, technology is great when it works, and when it it doesn't work, that's kind of to be expected sometimes. But they are working. They've they've disconnected a couple times, so I've had to kind of reconnect them. But so far, so good. Those are those technology stutters. That's what I call those. <laughs> that's right. So, um, hmm. well, you're from Kentucky. Um, I have some relatives in Kentucky, but one of the things that's important to me and one of the people who I know is either listening or watching the playback, what, what bourbon do you recommend? Ooh, that is the million dollar question. So I'm not originally from Speaking Kentucky. Of my friend, he's in the NSA community. I won't name him, but uh, okay. he's in Texas. And um, uh, I was going to say, there, there's a lot of people from uh, Texas in the NSA community, so I won't try and guess, but my favorite is Woodford Reserve, followed by um, ooh, Larceny is also a really good brand. Um, that's one that one of my friends put me onto um, when I first moved here. So, yeah, those are top two. Well, Cameron Franchek from uh, Michigan, he he's the one that got me to convert. I used to be Catholic. Yeah. No, he got me to convert. <laughs> Scotch to bourbon. It was it was a it oh. was a very special moment that we shared together. So I have him to thank or to blame. Um, <laughs> fantastic. So there's so many angles we can go with. Let's go. So the yeah. story I wanted to tell you was a story I shared a couple months ago. Um, 
And I think it ties into the, to the idea that you said that, you know, you went to a couple of speech therapists and they were like, well, I, how can I help you? I don't hear any stuttering. What do you want to work on? And you're like, well, I, I stutter. I do. I, I live with that experience. <laughs> Episodically, kind of at yeah. unpredictable times, sometimes when I totally expect it and sometimes when I totally don't, mm -hmm. um, there, it, whoop, there it is. And whoop, whoop. Uh, so I've had kids and moms come and they tell me the saddest thing about their experiences. Yeah, mom says, I've been to three speech therapists. They've all insisted that my child does not stutter. He's a school-age kid, reliable reporter. I don't know why anyone wouldn't believe him or his mom. Mm -hmm. but he said, yeah, well, it didn't show up on the evaluation in that little window of time that we met in the office. So the mom said, this is my fourth evaluation. Now, either you're going to tell me that my son has a stutter and they were all wrong, or you're going to tell me I'm crazy and I'm going to check myself in to some facility to get help. And I think that one of the conversations I have that's kind of funny and I think is reflected by what you're saying is when someone tells you their experience, you can't deny their experience. And I've never seen a person or a mother or a father come in for help saying, we're dealing with this stuttering thing or stammering thing. It's no longer an evaluation. You already know what you're dealing with because they've just told you. Now you just got to figure out, well, what's the nature of it? What's the nature of the person? And how can you come in and offer something that might be helpful to help them find their way? But I think when, if you're a speech therapist listening, or if you're a person who stutters and you've had Carl's experience or that experience I just described, honor people's experiences. And if it's a young person or a not such young person or a parent, they, stuttering is one of those things you don't make up. I, I don't know if anyone can challenge me on that. I'm, I'm all ears, but I've never heard of anyone making it up. Um, maybe yeah. there's a specific set of exceptions, but that's a very unusual setup. The story mm -hmm. I wanted to tell you was related to this, the idea of, of identity and perception. And I just want to jump right in. Some people might be listening to your voice, Carl, and they might say, oh, I, don't, I don't think he's black. He doesn't sound black. He doesn't talk <laughs> like the kind of black guy, I would assume. <laughs> Oh, he doesn't yeah. stutter. I, he doesn't know a stutter. I know what a stutter mm -hmm. sounds like. And he, mm -hmm. no, 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 no. He may, he may get stuck on his words sometimes. Mm -hmm. And so again, it's the same idea really as, you yeah. know, coming up with an idea of what you think it's supposed to look like and, and mm -hmm. kind of like disregarding the person's experience. So I, I, I shared yeah. this story at the height of the country, really going through some tearing itself apart and, and coming to grips mm -hmm. with, you know, the unfair, unjust, perpetuated regard for people, uh, for black people and for other communities that get marginalized or judged and wearing a yarmulke, I can take off my yarmulke and I can exude white male privilege. Um, but once my yarmulke is on my head, I can certainly say that I've had my moments of being, you know, treated a certain way or gotten the short end of the stick. Um, but at this moment in time, focus is on, you know, the repeated injustice to the black and brown community and so the story is that i was in the i was in grant i was in penn station grant, penn station penn station in new york and that was when we used to still take trains bc before corona gosh gosh i can't even before think corona. of a time yeah, where we yeah, used to, to yeah, travel you would not there. want to be there um <laughs> well, even then it's not really the greatest place to be. Um, <laughs> right you're looking, I was standing there and I got my yarmulke on and I'm dressed for work and I'm just coming out of the office having done a couple of appointments and I'm kind of like wiped out and I'm looking at the board to find the train and a, and a black man starts approaching me. And uh, I really, I try to espouse and that was the way I was raised and my, my dad was someone who went down south and marched for civil rights in the 60s and mm -hmm. that's like in my, in my blood is treating every person as a human being first and then figuring out what tribe or team they might be on. But fundamentally, yeah. we're all part of the same human fabric. And, mm -hmm. uh, but I gotta say, for whatever reason, maybe the way he was dressed, or maybe in, in Penn Station, you don't just approach people and get so close. This man got close to me and he says to me, I kid you not, something that's never been said to me. Clearly you didn't see this video, this is really good. He I says, have not, so you get my full you first time reaction. Yeah, you get ready. Everybody fasten on your seatbelts, whatever time zone you're in. I feel bad if you're in Pacific. Because <laughs> this is a little early in the morning. He says to me, I just want to apologize to your people for, for what happened to your people in the Holocaust. Wow. How do you, what do you do with that? How do you yeah, impact that, that? 
that, in that, that moment. Was moment. <laughs> yeah. I'm like, yeah. Uh, well, <laughs> thank you. I mean, I think thank you yeah. is the right thing to say. Um, I said, yeah. no one's ever said that to me before. I said, I, I want to apologize mm -hmm. to your people for what your people endured, you know, in this country. Um, now certainly, he wasn't taking responsibility for what happened in the Holocaust. And I wasn't taking responsibility for what people unrelated to me had done and perpetrated. But we were mm -hmm. both acknowledging a reality of each other's experiences and, you know, acknowledging the empathy to care and to acknowledge and to just show some, I feel for what your people have been through. And then that, that you know, being a part of your people, you probably have a share in that experience you know, to a greater degree yeah. or lesser degree in an individual way. But so we, we had this engagement, right? So I said, you know, mm -hmm. what's your name? I wanted to get personal. So his name was Mike Brown. And he tells mm -hmm. me to train every day. And he says, thank you to what I said. Because I don't know how many people, I don't know as a black man, what you would say, Carl, if I walked up to you in Penn Station, I said, I just want to apologize <laughs> on behalf of what your, for what your people have endured. You know, what would you say? Have you ever had someone walk up to you and say that? First off, wow. Uh, I don't, I can't say I've ever had anyone walk up to me in kind of a similar experience. I feel like I've had people kind of confide in me because they think of me as a safe person and we can kind of go along that path of what safe means and <laughs> kind of in that context, but, um, well, I want you know, to come think, back to that. I just wanted yeah. to ask if you ever heard that. <laughs> The story gets uh, even better, Carl. Yeah. Wait till you hear oh, where it goes. Really? <laughs> so so you're, you're awesome. Answer you usually now. know what to say, but you haven't had that happen yet. It, it's it's really rare to get me completely speechless, even as a person who stutters. My wife will tell you, and my best friends will tell you, but no, I can honestly say I've never had that experience. I've had Don't people. Mike Brown. Mike Brown got it started. Mike Brown. Yeah. <laughs> Mike, Brown. So Mike Brown says to me, you know, I'm sorry for the Holocaust. I said, I'm sorry for what your people have gone through. And then we get personal and he says to me, you know, yeah. He says, just a few minutes ago, there was a white lady, a middle-aged lady, and she was carrying her baggage through Penn Station. And I offered to help her. And she told me, yeah, I'm okay, I got it, thanks, no thanks. And, and he said, that, that's cool, I was just offering. But then I turned around and I saw she, she took help just from a young white guy. She just didn't wanna take the help from me because maybe the color of my skin made me seem un, unsafe. And just at that moment, Carl, luck would have it that a lovely, a lovely white couple come up to me, walk up to me. Now, I'm not really oriented in Penn Station. Mike has now told me that he comes on the train every day and travels to work in New Jersey. And this couple comes up to me, they're visiting tourists from some place in America. And they turn to me and walk up real close and they're like, excuse me, could you tell us how to get to New Jersey? And I said, <laughs> Well, I, I wouldn't have the foggiest clue. I'm actually trying to figure out how to get myself where I need to go. But my buddy, Mike, right, right, like right here. Yeah. He, and Mike goes on to give them great directions. And they say, thank you. And they're about to turn away and walk off. And I said, you know, just excuse me for a second. When you came over, you, you saw the two of us were talking. You only addressed me. Why do you think he was invisible? Mm-hmm. Another speechless moment, but it was a good moment. And it was yeah. a conversation to had or, or a thought to bring up. So I just wanted to share that. It was a story that truly happened a couple years ago. I then took a picture with Mike, a selfie with him. And I told him I would carry that with me and pray for his well-being and for his family. And we had a nice little back and forth. And, and I'll be honest, I was a little sketched when I thought, should I email him the picture? Like he asked me to email him. And like, I was mm -hmm. thinking just as I would with anybody, like, do I really want to get into an email dialogue or reveal any of my private information? And I chose to, and it, it went beautifully. So, mm -hmm. so Mike Brown is a buddy. He's a brother. Nice. And, uh, you know, I just wanted to share that story because I think it brings out everything that needs to be considered in terms of, you know, when things become politicized, and, and I don't want this to be a political conversation, but I think when we can bring it into the interactions that we have with the people in our neighborhoods, in our jobs, in our schools, in our communities, in our houses of worship, whatever. And if you don't have anybody, when you look around, start finding people, <laughs> find people yeah. to talk to, find people different than you. 
I said when mm -hmm. I opened up with Scott, you know, we have a lot of things in common and we have some things that are different. And that's where we should start all our engagements, you know, find that common ground connection. Anyway, so I wanted to share the story and I wanted to give you a chance, Carl, to just reflect and share, you know, I don't stutter and I'm not black, but I'm listening and I'm yep. interested in having these conversations. So for me and for anyone that would appreciate, and I know there are many, uh, mm -hmm. your insight, you're so articulate, you're so thoughtful. And as you said, you've, you've become a very deliberate and talented spokesman. So, you know, for the NSA. So if you could bring it and make it personal, what does Carl, not speaking for anybody else, not being political, mm -hmm. just what does Carl right. want some other people to know and to hear about your experience and what you'd hope others would know? Yeah, uh, so I think what you said early on and when you were talking really stuck home to me. Um, and, you know, it was the fact that, um, you know, I just feel like I've been listening to the story and so it's kind of escaped me a little bit, but the gist of it was, um, you know, we are all different and we need to acknowledge each other's differences um, and different is not necessarily bad. And I think that um, that is important to realize and that's important to remember. Um, we all have inherent uh, biases and actually I will grab a book. Wow, and, uh, look at that product placement. Uh, I did not intentionally, but I actually read this book. Uh, it's called Biased. It's by, it's by uh, Jennifer Eberhardt and she's a leading uh, social psych or uh, social psychologist or psychiatrist or whatever. And um, I actually read this for a book club meeting for my alma mater. We had a book discussion uh, last week, I think. And I mean, I, as you see, I have tabs of different things, but like this book was so important because, you know, it kind of talked about how we all are biased and we all have our inherent biases and there's nothing wrong with that that's just kind of how we shape the world that's how we kind of respond to things um just like you were saying you know when you first saw mike approach you you were kind of like oh gosh i don't know what's going to happen because someone is coming to me that person's very big what's going to happen like you know that's an inherent bias there's nothing wrong with that but the fact that you were open to be like okay well what's going to happen what's this guy want with me i think that's the important thing um to remember so kind of, I just, that kind of brought me back to that book because that book was really um, uh, powerful for me. But based on my experiences um, as a black person who stutters, my parents from an early age um, kind of goes back to speech therapy. They knew that I was different and that I would always be perceived as different in this world because of the color of my skin. And one thing that they, I think wanted nothing more than for me was to not let anything hold me back and to pr particularly not let my stuttering hold me back. And so, you know, we were kind of talking a little bit before we started and talking about how, you know, having such a strong support system, um, especially as a kid who stutters is so important. And, you know, looking back on it now, I can appreciate it. But back then it was frustrating because my parents would be the parents who they wouldn't order for me if I was out. They were like, no, you're gonna have to do it because we're not gonna be here all the time. And so you're gonna have to put yourself in these positions and do these uncomfortable things. And you know, if there was a relative who'd be calling the house, you know, they would hand me the phone and say, hey, pick up the phone, your aunt wants to talk to you. And you know, as a kid who stutters, like I don't wanna talk on the phone. I don't wanna talk to my no, no easy relative. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, no, 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 they, 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 they didn't. And, um, you know, they weren't hard, but they, I think were real. And they're like, look, your life is going to be different. Even more so, it might be difficult because you stutter. And we don't want anything to hold you back. And we don't want your skin color to hold you back. We don't want your stuttering to hold you back, but acknowledge that life is going to be different and maybe more difficult for you. And so, you know, they were always pushing me to do these things that took me out of my comfort zone. Um, and, you know, I'm grateful for that experience. Uh, I think in terms of what's going on now in this country, I think that, you know, people are just upset and they're tired and they're confused. And, you know, there's so much politi there's so much politicizing from, you know, uh, the media in different places, but, you know, a really important quote that one of my friends kind of impressed upon me in college is the personal is uh, the personal is political. And to me, that is important because, you know, we all have our identities and our experiences and we can't get away from those. We can't, 
you know, because I'm a black man, I, I can't hide that. I don't want to hide that. I want to lean into that. I want you to see me as a black man. I don't want to hear, oh, I don't see color. Because to me, that is not true. Everyone sees color. We all see our differences. I want you to understand my differences and accept my differences because those experiences and those differences, they make me who I am. And I think that when we acknowledge all of who we are as people, our lived experiences, our personalities, you know, our thoughts, our dreams, our goals, our hopes, all of those things, you know, those are the things that are important. And yes, like you and I, our skin colors are different. That's the first thing that people can see. But, you know, um, I know, yeah. I know. <laughs> but, you know, uh, I, I think in, inherently as people, we all just want to live a good life and provide, you know, for our families and make our families proud and, you know, have a strong sense of community, all those things. Um, and I think that when we get back to understanding that, that is the foundation from which we can grow and really, you know, see each other fully. I don't know if I answered your uh, you question, should, but there, I guess there, that was... There was no question that needed an answer, Carl. It was an open mic opportunity. Um, I could listen to you all night long. <laughs> Thank you. Amazing. Thank Amazing. You. Look, I think... Uh, a childhood memory I have is, um, you know, I went to Jewish day schools. Everybody there was white and Jewish for the most part. Um, now, one of my good buddies, his name is Nisim Black. He used to be a rapper from Seattle. Now he's a Hasidic Jew. Yes, he still has I the rapper in Seattle inside of him and on his skin. Mm -hmm. um, and he's in his latest album, and I encourage anybody to check it out. I'm sharing it with Dominique Kennedy. Uh, it's mm -hmm. great music. He was, he's really good but it's all yeah. positive and spiritual stuff. And it's all about bringing the different flavors that are part of his tapestry of his identity. And as you said, we all have so many different identities and identity is, this is something that was said last year at the NSA uh, pre-conference workshops. And I can't remember to quote him. He was from Gallaudet. And he said, um, he said, identity is a performance and we can step in and we can step out and, and there's some fluidity there. And I think that uh, that's a conversation, right? Because like you said, there's certain things you don't want to check at the door. You want to bring with you fully and proudly. And then in other ways, sometimes you don't want that difference to be the most prominent thing in the room. You don't want that difference to be disproportionately um, uh, focused on. You want it to be kind of in a measured way woven into I'm a person and here are some other features about me. And I think Michael Levin says it beautifully in, in his movie, Transcending Stuttering, which I'm gonna show you a clip because I wanna get your input. Uh, he yeah, says, yeah. you know, it used to be stuttering was like front and center. And, and now stuttering is one of a thousand things that makes me who I am. And so mm. I think that's a beautiful idea of thinking about the multiple facets, like a diamond has multiple sides, multiple facets that make us who we are. I'm a baller, I'm a nerd. I'm a employee, I'm a husband, I'm a son, I'm a brother, I'm a nephew, I'm an uncle, all the roles we play, all the identities that at different times in our life become at different moments in the day, we have to step mm -hmm. into like the prominence of that identity. I'm always a dad, I'm always a husband, I'm always faithful. But at certain moments, like right now with you, I'm not bringing that front and center. Mm -hmm. I'm not ignoring that or turning that off. So how do we not sell out but also not make it disproportionate. And I think these conversations are so tender, but should be mm -hmm. uh, adventured into with, um, with mutual respect and, and tolerance in both directions, both for those of us yeah. engaging with others who might feel that they have some feelings that they need to share. And for those who are on the end of, of feeling like they're finally getting a chance to share, to have the patience and tolerance for those of us that are stepping into that space, you know, and may say the wrong thing, you know, it's kind of inherent in it. So I get a lot of guidance from Katie Gore on this. I'm a, I'm a slow learner, but I'll just keep <laughs> leaning into the conversations and making some faux pas with the hope that the intent to have the conversation is better than not having it, even if we make a couple missteps. Exactly, exactly. Um, and there was something you said, it made me look back to what something that my dad told me as a very early age, you know, when you were saying, um, you know, uh, stuttering is just one part of your, it's just one part of your identity. And, you know, you've got a thousand other things that make up who you are as a person. Stuttering is just one, one little part of that. 
And I think <clears throat> at times as a person who stutters, it can seem like stuttering is front and center. And like, you know, if I'm having a hard block or in a, a conversation, I can't seem to get anything out. Yes, you may see who I am and what I look like, but in that moment, you're like, well, that's a guy who stutters. Um, and it kind of made me think back to sometimes when I'd be getting down on myself and I'd have these periods of, you know, shame and things like that. Um, my dad would tell me, he was like, look, if stuttering is the worst thing that you are experiencing in your life, then that is not terrible because there are people who are dealing with things and suffering with things and, you know, other things that are going on. And so for you to have your stuttering just be the biggest problem that you face. Yes, it's big. I'm not going to diminish that, but like, you know, just think about that every, and I think his bigger theme was we all have things that we struggle with and things that we have to deal with and adapt to. And, you know, just for you, your stuttering sometimes is the most, um, is sometimes the most, uh, visible thing that you have and so people you know will see it and I think that's a really good way for you to people to kind of relate to you and you to be allow people to open up with you um, my wife tells me all the time she's like you're just a people person and people just love to talk to you and I don't know why because she's like I'm not that way <laughs> and I think you know I've kind of brought that out of her a little bit but you know I think that maybe because I stutter that's kind of made me more of a open person and people kind of feel like they can talk and share with me because they're like, well, this guy's going through something. So, you know, I'll, I'll open up with him. So, yeah, just. I want to circle to back to that, something you shared about courting and dating and marriage, and we'll, we'll come mm -hmm. back to that. But I just wanted to ask something really surprising, listening to you reflecting on lessons from your dad and your mom and growing up and the relationship or the proportionality of the focus or recognition of difference in terms of if you're a black man, you're also a person who stutters and some of the opportunities, challenges, hardships that may come with that, that may come your way, that you may find people that don't have um, a way to deal with that in a, in a way that's fair. Um, I was wondering, because I'm thinking of one buddy of mine who may be watching this, and he also works in, as an exec in healthcare. And he says to me that I said to him, because he was really struggling with being a guy who stutters in the room. And I said, you know, I imagine you're also one of the only, you know, second generation Haitian immigrants in the room. I imagine in this neighborhood, they're mostly not people that look like you. He said, yeah, I never thought of that. I, I, I've been kind of focused on the fact that I stutter and like how yeah. prominently that disturbs me. So I was just wondering, you could reflect on the proportionality of your lived experience in terms of being a person who stutters and how much that was like something that you were invested in and cared about mm -hmm. as compared to and in relation to, and it doesn't have to be either or, but I'm just curious like how, because I think that's an interesting thing about intersectionality here. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, so my parents approach, I guess I'll kind of preface my answer with this. When I was growing up, my parents had kind of very different approaches to how to acknowledge my stuttering. My dad was very much laid back guy. My dad is the one who's from in Kentucky. And so, you know, I kind of think that kind of is where his persona kind of comes from. He's very, he's very laid back, very chill. Is he the Woodford um, or the other one? He, Which does he go for? What do you mean? Bourbon. What's bourbon? His bourbon? Um, he was not really a big bourbon drinker. So he, he actually passed away in 2015, but he was not a big bourbon drinker. He might have a beer every now and then. Um, he was a deacon in our church. And so he didn't like to drink or didn't like to people to see him drink, but I guess he's, he's passed away now. So I can kind of share the story, but he, he would sometimes if we were out at like a family event, he, he might have like one beer, just, you know, kind of didn't mean to cast him. <laughs> hey, I was just wondering if he's yeah. from Kentucky, the first thing I think yeah. of baseball bats exactly and 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 uh bourbon so bourbon yeah now he, he he wasn't a big bourbon drinker so i didn't i didn't, I didn't get that from him <laughs> but he, uh whether he knew about your favorites is also irrelevant we can move on with this conversation. <laughs> so what the, yeah. his approach you were saying his approach yeah so his approach was very much you know like he was very patient and very calm and i think to me that was off-putting sometimes because i was kind of expecting a response from people like when i had that initial disfluent moment you know that that's usually people are not really paying attention you know they might be looking at you but not really looking but when you have that first that kind of stops people because they're not expecting that and they kind of like look up like oh what's going on and he was always very much calm very much looked me in my eyes and just waited for what I wanted to say and I that terrified me 
<laughs> which was very odd kind of thinking back at it. But just that calm and that just presence was very much un was very much unsettling to me. Whereas my mom, my mom was from the Bronx. And so she is very much, hey. I know, I like, I still to this day, I'm like, how did they get together? This guy from Kentucky, who was very much chill, but loved to talk to people and connect. My mom who's from the Bronx is kind of like, rough around that, rough around that edges a little bit like, how did they connect? And of course, they made me that wasn't just, a judgment about people from the Bronx. Yeah. So. No, 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 it was not. But I would say that to say that my mom's approach was very much like, hey, you're not using your techniques. What are you trying to say? Um, you know, you've told me that you want to go into in, into politics when you're older. You, you can't be doing this when you're, you know, if you're going into politics. And so I had these conflicting uh, messages of compliments. What do I do. Compliments. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it was kind of weird. And I think that, you know, um, that kind of shaped my experiences a little bit. But I think that, it was always keenly aware to me that, you know what, like you're first gonna be judged by your skin because that's the outward, what people can see. And then maybe you'll get judged by your speech and how you sound. And, you know, I think they're, they really wanted uh, me to just kind of push forward because they're like, well, we don't want people to think, well, he's black and he stutters like, gosh, like, you know, he's already got kind of I don't want to say two strikes, but you know, it's, it's kind right. of things are going to be harder for him. And I think that that's why they were so much wanting to push me because they're like, we don't want that to hold you back. And, you know, to this day, I talked to my mom and, you know, we'll, we'll chat. And she actually was on during the NSA's uh, virtual conference this year. We had uh, one of the first days of it, we kind of had a welcome from the board and my mom was on that call because I told her I was like hey mom I'm going to be talking you know at this conference thing and I saw her name in the zoom participants panel and I kind of had one of those flashbacks when I was a kid like oh my god oh my god what's my mom gonna say and you know she kind of told me she she sent me a text she was like I am so proud of you and what you're doing and all of you've accomplished and um I think that for them they just wanted to know that I would be okay and okay in the sense of I would be a well-adapted, well-adjusted person, and I wouldn't let stuttering hold me back. And I think that was their fear. And, you know, I won't say that every day is rosy and, and sunshine. I think you kind of had that conversation with either uh, Dominique Kennedy or, you know, uh, uh, Scott Yaris. But, you know, you were kind of talking about how, you know, kind of with Brayton Harrington, you know, you, you're, you're discussing, you know, there, there's like ebbs and flow. Of course, what, what we saw with Brayton, you know, you're like, wow, this kid's awesome. He's a pioneer, but he's also a teenager who stutters. You know, I'm sure his life is not going to always, you know, he probably is, he has his moments that are, stuttering can be hard. Um, and so I think it's important to acknowledge that. And I don't, one of the things I want to let people know is for me as a person who stutters, Yes, I feel like I've come a long way in my quote unquote stuttering journey, but there are days where I'm still like, gosh, stuttering sucks and it's hard and I can admit that. So that's great. That's great. Yeah. I'm going to, I want to take a commercial break, so to speak. It's not yeah. a commercial break. Don't worry. But <laughs> I just got to get my bat, my uh, plug again. I'm sitting on Zoom meetings too long, but I, here's what I'm going to yeah, do. I just yeah. want to show you a resource that I we put together uh, at Schneider Speech regarding um, educating ourselves and tuning into issues of difference when it comes to you know what's going on in our country. So if you just look here on our blog page, I just want to bring your attention down here. You can see all our past conversations, and you can also jump down here. We had a three-part series on you know we called it Black Matters, Privilege, and Responsibility, and then resources. And there's some incredible stuff here that we're very proud of. So if you're looking to dive deeper and learn more, some very good stuff. And I think the story I told at the beginning is there uh, mm -hmm. with a lot more tears. Um, <laughs> and then I'll bring your attention here. And this is what I'm going to play right now while I get my plug. Our documentary film. So if you click there, you'll see, and you can play these for yourself. And I wanted to play this for you, Carl, and everybody listening, and get your input. This is the story of Stephen uh, this is the middle of the film, Transcending Stuttering, and Stephen tells his story of a pivotal moment. I just wanted to catch your reflections on this. Let me know if this plays through for you. You know, I had a really, really hard time. Right now it's Taro, you hear him? You know, I'll have blocks. Yeah. The coach told me like, what the play was, and um, I 
Couldn't get the play call out. Couldn't. I, I slowed down, took a deep breath. Like I did like all the techniques I tried, but for some reason it wouldn't come out. For about uh, three minutes, like I was just like, hold up, stop. <laughs> then I'm like, I was like, I'll try again. But um, it would be um, like really hard. And then, like, after practice, like, I told myself I was going to quit the team. Mm -hmm. I mean, like, I hate football. Like, I hate people. Like, I hate people who laugh. I hate people who didn't laugh. You know what I mean? Like, I just had, like, that attitude. And then, like, after, like, the game, the coach, um, he pulled me in his office. And he told me that the teammates had voted me captain. He was voted captain by his teammates this year, and uh, I don't think there's a, a better man to receive the Arthur Sean Rhodes Award, Stephen Miller. Yeah. <laughs> um, I knew then. That I just like couldn't like turn my back on them. One of the wow. So that's from the that's movie Transcending that. Stuttering, which you can see for free on our website. Um, Carl, just wanted to play that for you and get your reflection on it. Yeah, I've, I've got chills. I mean, just just watching that, um, you know, because I think that experience you have one of those pivotal uh, moments, you know, with stuttering, and you're just like, oh why am I doing this, you know, and you kind of get down on yourself and have, you know, that frustration and shame and embarrassment and all, all, all that stuff that gets mixed in. But then, you know, you have an experience where you see, okay, maybe this is not, you know, stuttering doesn't have to define me. And, you know, I can live a full and rich life, even as a person who stutters. And I feel like that to me at this point in my life, that is the message that I want people to understand is that, you know, in spite of stuttering, you can do amazing things. Um, so and I think that really kind of hits that point home for me. Thanks. So yeah. And I, I wanted to share that I'm preparing this as part of a piece for the ISAD conference, International Stuttering Awareness Day. So from October 1st to October 22nd, check it out, ISAD. Dot org, I believe. It's an international online conference of, of voices and sharing from the people who stutter and from the professional community and interaction around that. And then October 22nd, of course, is the day dedicated to international stuttering awareness. Um, their, their theme this year is resilience and bouncing back. So I was looking at different stories. Mm. And I think what stands out in Stephen's story is that Stephen gets so tough on himself. And then what happens is through the support of others and the feedback of others, he finds and restores the belief in himself. And what came out from Braden's story, and I heard people in the stuttering community talk about how important it is for those of us that get over a challenge or, or somehow overcome a hurdle or find stronger, higher ground to share with people who are earlier on with younger people, because what it would mean for those of us that didn't have that, you know, could make the world a whole different place, could make life entirely different. So it's an invitation for any of us and all of us have something to offer someone that's earlier on in the journey uh, can be a very powerful thing. So that, I think that's a theme for Steven. He kind of had it in him, but he was hard on himself. But then hearing from his coach and his teammates meant a lot. Mm -hmm. And uh, you shared with me, I thought it would be nice to touch on approaching your one-year anniversary. Don't forget, it's the 28th. It's on my calendar. I'm going to send you a reminder. I just don't want <laughs> you to step into the same mistake I made. I'm passing on the, uh, <laughs> the experience right here no, of sure. uh, previous mistakes. Uh, experience is the name I give to my mistakes. Um, <laughs> so, you, you know, as a guy, um, and this is universal, um, but for someone who stutters or for any guy about to get married, you're insecure about certain things. You're worried about certain things that you've kind of married, managed to hide, cover up, overcompensate perhaps. And before you marry someone, you got to make a decision. Do I want to kind of go into this hiding it? Or do I want to go into this putting it on the table? But what's going to happen if I put this on the table? So can you share with us how yeah. you dealt with your opening up and choosing or not choosing to be open, what you expected, how it played out? 
Yeah. So my wife is in the other room just behind this wall. So I don't know if she's, she, she's watching live or she'll probably watch later, but um, when we, so my wife and I have known of each other since we were, uh, she was 16 and I was 17. Um, I lived in Virginia. Uh, it's where I was born, where I was from, and she was from Kentucky. And since my dad's from Kentucky, every few years we would come back to visit um, and our families grew up together. And so, you know, they kind of knew each other before we were even born. And so we met then and hadn't seen each other until much later. Um, and so, you know, uh, I came back to visit Kentucky in 2016 and, you know, she was there and we um, connected and talked and just kind of hit it off. And I went back to Virginia and every day since then we have talked. And so, you know, when things looked like they were getting serious, um, I don't think I'd ever talked about my stuttering to her. Um, and I didn't think she heard me stutter because I thought, I thought as a person who stutters, I was like, oh, I'm so good at hiding it. Um, she, she, she won't know. She doesn't know. How can she know? I'm, you know, I've been a covert person who stutters for my whole life. I'm so good at hiding it. And so, as you said, I kind of had this, I had this moment of reckoning where I had to be like, okay, well, she's, I want to be with her, you know, long-term. So I want her to know who I am as a person and stuttering is a part of my identity. And so it was very serious. And I said, Hey, B, uh, I, I want to, share something with you about myself and she's like okay well what is it <laughs> kind of concerned like uh you don't you don't have like three kids somewhere <laughs> that are 10 years old like uh what's going on and I was like no 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 no. I um just want to let you know that I stutter and um you know that that's a part of me and I just kind of wanted to share that with you and she kind of stopped uh and she's like oh I already knew that and I was like what what do you mean you knew that I, I'm just telling you and she's like no 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 I from the moment I met you, I knew that you stuttered, but you didn't seem phased by it. And so I figured, well, when he wants to bring it up to me, he'll bring it up to me and I won't acknowledge it until he does. Um, and I was like, wow, that really kind of made me think uh, because to her, you know, she saw, I mean, we hadn't seen each other in person that many times, but she kind of saw me as, you know, this guy who likes to talk to people and, you know, kind of is like still chatty. That, even that was the stutters. identity. That was the identity. Yeah. 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 That was the identity that I, you know, in my, in my, you know, I wanted to exude. Um, but I still, you know, had my struggles with insecurity around my stuttering. And, you know, that that's kind of what I wanted to bring in terms of her world. Like, yeah, this is still a part of me. And she was like, no, I know. And that was just felt like a weight off my shoulders. I know. And I actually have another story um, yeah. that's, I'll make it really short, but we were on our no, honeymoon. Make, make it good. Okay. Okay. Well, we were on our honeymoon. We went on a cruise and, you know. Um, cruise. That's another BC before Corona thing. Yeah. Yeah, that is. Oh, it was a fun time. But we, um, at dinner, you know, if, if you decide to go to like the formal, uh, like dinner they have on the ship, um, you know, then you were more than likely sat at a table with other people. So we'd gone on one cruise before, I think when we were engaged and we kind of had a table just by ourselves. And so that was neat. So I figured that would be that same experience. And so we get down to dinner on the first night, you know, we're all dressed up kind of nice and we're at a round table with probably four or five other cu couples. They're all older white couples who you know it seems like they go on cruises all the time and so you know we're this young newlywed uh, couple and of course you know we look different we look super young we're black and so I'm sure they were like oh who are these people so you know we're kind of chatting and um you know I, I was still you know meeting new people and so for me even though I'm very outwardly I'm okay with stuttering. It's still kind of nerve wracking because we're humans and we want to put our best foot forward. We want people to not judge us and things like that. So I was, I was kind of nervous. Um, and so, you know, eventually it was just um, my wife and another uh, couple and the husband actually stuttered as well. And wow. um, yeah. And, and we, I think we both had kind of acknowledged uh, you know, kind of uh, stuttering a little bit. It's kind of like the elephant in the room at the table, but we hadn't talked about it. And so at the very end of us eating, um, our waiter came to, came over to the table and he's like, hey, 
it's been a pleasure to serve you. Would you guys like dessert? And we said, yeah, we ordered. And then he asked us our names. And that anticipatory fear of being, you know, asked your name, which as a person who stutters, the one thing you can't word switch, your name is your name. And so, you know, we all went around the table and then it got to me and I had the hardest block and I said, and it just, you know, felt it. And, you know, I felt like it was an eternity. It was probably only 10 seconds, maybe. Um, and the guy kind of like smirked and he said, okay. <laughs> and he walked away and I just, God, I felt myself sweating through my suit and I was like, oh. And so um, the husband of the couple uh, that we were at dinner with, he's like, I knew that you had something. He's like, you stutter too. And I was thinking, well, yeah, obviously it's out there. And so we actually had a kind of connection about uh, stuttering and kind of talked, talked about it as, you know, uh, you know, as men who stutter and also being married to women who do not stutter and kind of how do you support your partner and kind of had that conversation, which was really neat. I don't think I'd ever had that conversation with someone and, you know, talking, he was a guy from Ohio. He had his own landscaping business or something like that. But, you know, to me that just kind of impressed upon the fact that, you know what, if you stutter, you can do anything that you put your mind to. It might be more difficult, um, but, you know, you, you can do anything that you want. And, you know, that was a really cool moment uh, that kind of we shared that was probably 15 years ago, I would have like, oh, wanted to hide and never come back out because I'm like, oh, people saw me stutter. But then I just was like, you know what? That happened. I'm still alive. I'm still kicking. It's okay. Just move on and go to the next thing. Amazing. So I, I, I'm so happy that, and I hope for more people, such experiences happen. For me and my family, it's, it's a running joke. My dad and I are like stuttering magnets. It's like wherever <laughs> we go, it's like just comes out. Oh, what do you do? And like often you tell people you're a speech therapist, it's a conversation stopper. You know, mm -hmm. people are really self-conscious and, and, and like invariably, whatever, if it's a TSA agent, I don't know who else talks to the TSA agents, we do. Um, you know, whatever, wherever you, and again, who's that, right? Before Corona, yeah. but you know, random people you meet in your life, it's an amazing thing when karma, karma is a thing um, and, and it can be a good thing. So it's funny, like for me, in certain places, my identity, the yarmulke as an Orthodox Jew can be a conversation stopper, a door closer. And then there's a, there's a phenomenon we talk about. It can also be a door opener people see the yarmulke and suddenly they're part of the tribe and they start having conversations. We call that, you get smeared. You get smeared. <laughs> they start like talking it up. Oh, bagels, huh? You know, <laughs> where are you going for Yom Kippur, huh? Um, I wonder if we can come up with a term, Carl, since you like puns. Like, what is it when, mm -hmm. when, when one person identifies the other also has a stutter? Yeah. You know, what, what we can come mm. with block party right you know like i don't know yeah <laughs> I, I like that i actually think there's a new stuttering group on, on facebook in addition to the few that exist i didn't pull called, that one out of nowhere that was it's that called was block stutter party. block party yeah and block and party. i'm not i'm not sure if that's something that you should take uh credit for someone kind of stole your idea but no 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 no. all theirs i'll just take, i'll just smear them with something else but um <laughs> there we go <laughs> this has been awesome i wanted to just make sure to make a plug for the national stuttering association carl is a board member um, hopefully this will be the first yes. of a few conversations. I did put in the Facebook chat um, the link. They've got some incredible projects going on, uh, both in terms of talking about stuttering and people who stutter in the workplace, uh, in military, uh, people living with secrecy and kind of holding in all kinds of uh, stuttering experiences and hiding and suppressing and ducking and dodging and then legitimate ways to do that and still go after the things you want, the relationships you want, the jobs you want, finding your way with that, but finding community within community, because just like the black community is a very diverse community, the Jewish community is very diverse, the stuttering community is a diverse community. And we're trying, I think the next era, and I feel like Carl's a big part of ushering in that next era of kind of like differentiating the tents within the big open tent, you know, and mm -hmm. at the same time, not losing the fact that we are all under one big tent and then all under one big planet, as Ruben yeah. Schuff likes to remind me. When we get to Mars, it's going to remind us that it's a planetary existence. It's not even going to be international. It's then going to be intergalactic, you know? Yeah. But this has been a great conversation. And I just first thank you for your generosity of time and then give people a teaser that there will be another conversation, I hope, if Carl can carve out yeah. the time. 
and was, was so great. busy. The only time he had was Sunday morning, Labor Day weekend. That was the only time he, <laughs> the guy is so busy doing so many things. And for us, I'll just invite everybody, if you want to check out past conversations with people like Scott Yaris and Dominique Kennedy and John, um, John Gomez and countless other people. And then this Thursday, we're having Nathan Malapetti. And we have John Clausen coming up and Pam Mertz and Gerald McGuire and Shelly Joe Kraft and a couple other super fantastic people, Lee Reeves, um, who's a veterinarian from Texas. Um, so I invite everybody to check those out, schneiderspeech.com slash events. This Sunday, we have a free meetup for parents, a free meetup for teens, free meetup for adults, special guests, Cody Packer and others. Check it out. That's not even up on the website yet because we've been a little busy. But by tomorrow, it'll be there. But if you want to send us an email if you're interested, Carl, thank you, thank you, thank you. And God you. bless. Your wife is a very lucky lady. And your mom yes. is certainly, certainly, certainly uh, should be. If she's giving you any hard time, she should know. She's very, very proud. You are a very, um, a very much needed and very special voice in the community. And you should continue to have a lot of strength and time and resources to do great things. Thanks for taking the time to have a conversation. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it. I look forward to the future conversations. Oh, great.